On December the 11th, 1994, Philippine Airlines Flight 434 is two hours into the second leg of a routine flight from Manila to Tokyo. An unsuspecting passenger is sitting on a ticking bomb. The explosion on board cripples the flight control system. Unless the pilot can regain control, the jumbo jet may crash into the Pacific Ocean. This is Philippine Airlines 434. A bomb has exploded on board. Bravo, Oscar Mike Bravo. The bombing is a frightening new development by a terrorist on the cutting edge of science. The way that the, the timing device was hidden inside the Casio watch um, just made the whole, the whole thing very uh, concealable and, uh, and very worrisome. But this is more than the hunt for a terrorist bomber. This is a story of how investigators make a shocking discovery. The explosion on PAL 434 is only a test for an attack on American carriers an attack that would dwarf every other terrorist atrocity at the time. It's before sunrise on December the 11th, 1994. While most inhabitants of this city of a million and a half have a few more hours to sleep, 26-year-old Amaldo Forlani makes an early start. Forlani is not his real name. It's the alias he's chosen for today's mission. He's actually from Pakistan, not Italy. He is putting his latest invention through an important test. Everything must go like clockwork. In his line of work, there's no room for error. He is a highly skilled terrorist bomb builder. He packs the liquid explosive bomb very carefully. From his apartment downtown, it takes less than 30 minutes to get to the airport. He arrives in plenty of time for his 5 a.m. flight with Philippine Airlines. Before he can board, the bomber must outwit airport security screening procedures. He's designed the components of his bomb to pass undetected by X-ray and metal detection equipment. Or so he hopes. He bought the ticket as Amaldo Forlani. He's a skilled forger, and he has made himself a fake Italian passport with that identity. If his cover is blown, his career as a globe-trotting terrorist is over. Having successfully got the bomb through airport security, he boards his Philippine Airlines flight. The final destination of PAL 434 is Tokyo, but there's a stopover in the Philippine resort town of Cebu, over 550 kilometers to the south of Manila. This is as far as the bomber is flying today. It's 10,000 feet and weather's still looking clear. Thanks, Dex. I'm engaging autopilot. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. This is your Captain Ed Reyes speaking. Welcome aboard Flight 434, flying south from Manila to Cebu and continuing onward to Narita Airport, Tokyo. Flight 434 is under the command of Captain Ed Reyes, 
a former Air Force pilot who's been flying for Philippine Airlines for nine years. And our estimated arrival time is now 5.45. The first leg of the flight is fairly empty. Passengers are scattered around the jumbo jet's 400 seats. After takeoff, the bomber is able to move. He chooses seat 26K, located directly over the center fuel tank in some 747s. The cabin is tended by stewardess Maria de la Cruz. She flies domestic routes and has worked for Philippine Airlines for one year. Can I get you some juice or coffee? Juice, please. Now the bomber must find a vacant lavatory to assemble the explosive device. Arming the bomb only takes minutes, but requires total concentration. The final step is setting the timer so it will explode in four hours' time, long after he leaves the plane. He hides the bomb in the life jacket pocket underneath his seat. He then changes seats. When she returns, Maria de la Cruz notices that the roving passenger has moved seats again. She will remember that he left his breakfast untouched and that the rest of the flight passed uneventfully. As Philippine Airlines Flight 434 begins its final approach into Cebu, more passengers are getting ready to board the aircraft that will take them onwards to Tokyo. Cabin crew, prepare for landing. Cabin doors to automatic. PAL 434 lands in Cebu at 6.50 a.m. And several of the passengers disembark, including the terrorist with the alias Amaldo Forlani. Bye-bye. Thank you. Maria de la Cruz will also leave flight 434. A new cabin crew will take over for the four-and-a-half-hour flight to Tokyo. Two hundred and fifty six new passengers board the seven four seven that arrived from Manila. Many of the passengers in this cabin are Japanese. Among them is twenty four year old engineer Haruki Ikigami. He's looking forward to getting home to Tokyo after his first trip overseas. Airport congestion delays the departure by thirty eight minutes but the timer on the bomb under seat 26K continues to tick. Eight thirty a.m., December the 11th, 1994. All passengers for Philippine Airlines Flight 434 are now on board for the leg to Tokyo. None of them is aware that two hours earlier, a terrorist planted a time bomb under one of their seats. Steward Fernando Bayot is assisting passengers in the forward cabin on this four and a half hour flight. At 8.38, PAL 434 is cleared for takeoff. On the flight deck, Captain Ed Reyes is assisted by First Officer Jaime Herrera and Systems Engineer Dexter Comendador. Reyes and Comendador are both former Air Force pilots. Ruki Ikegami is seated in 26K, the seat occupied by the bomber earlier on the first leg of Flight 434 from Manila to Cebu. Several passengers in this cabin are co-workers, traveling with a Japanese tour group, 
including Keisuke Aoki and Masaharu Moshizuki. After takeoff, everything seemed normal. We were flying at 10,000 meters. I was reading a magazine, then the meal was served. After eating, I went to sleep. 31-year-old Yukihiko Sui stayed up all night on the last day of his trip, and he's ready to nap after breakfast. He's sitting in row 27, one row behind the seat vacated by the bomber four hours earlier. Ladies and gentlemen, this is your captain speaking. It's a beautiful day in Tokyo, sunny and 26 degrees. I expect we'll be landing at Narita Airport in two hours' time. Two hours into the flight, PAL 434 is cruising on autopilot 10,000 meters above Minami Daito Island, southern Japan. To ease the pilot's workload, the autopilot remains on throughout the flight, keeping the aircraft on a constant heading at altitude. God forgive me. That was my inner uh, uh, thought, you know. God forgive me, I think I'm going to die now. Then after that, I have to do what I had to do. Oh, I've lost control. I have control. Dex, check the presentation loss. Be prepared. Check the QRH for... Although the autopilot instantly corrects the aircraft's bank to the right, the effect of the blast is far from over. There was a loud bang which woke me up. I could feel the plane expanding from the pressure. I saw smoke as well as debris falling like powder. Ladies and gentlemen, please stay in your seat. The injured people were trying to get away from the area where the bomb was. I stood up and saw that a lot of people were bleeding. I thought my life was over. Stay in your seat, please. The cabin crew's first priority is to stop passengers leaving their seats. Yukihiko Usui is sitting in the row directly behind the explosion. Both his legs are badly wounded. Steward Fernando Bayot moves him away from the blast site. <laughs> Please, sit down and your <laughs> Bayot now turns his attention to Haruki Ikigami. He has been swallowed by the smoking hole where C-26K used to be. I saw this man, only his head and his arms were peering out of the hole, so I tried to uh, pull him out. After the struggle to lift him out, Bayot realizes that part of the lower half of Ikigami's body is missing. Within a couple of minutes, he dies. The cabin crew do not want Ikigami's death to panic passengers, so they pretend to minister to him. Bayot then reports to the captain. Oh, captain. Okay. Keep the passengers calm. Make sure they stay in their seats. There's been an explosion in row 26. One dead and several injured, and the cabin's full of smoke. There's a hole in the floor. Go inspect the damage, Dex. Yes, sir. Reyes' first concern is that the blast could make a hole in the aircraft's skin. This would lead to sudden depressurization in the cabin and necessitate an emergency descent. There was a huge gaping hole uh, beside her, and if a small tear in the skin of the aircraft was, uh, if there were a hole there, it most probably would open up and then pull us out of the aircraft. When I saw that there was no damage to the outer skin, I went up and reported to the captain while we assumed that the pressurization system would hold. Immediately after the explosion, the co-pilot's steering wheel slams to the right. 
and the aircraft banks in the same direction. The autopilot immediately corrects the deviation, but soon Reyes discovers that the autopilot steering system is another victim of the blast. Then I said, OK, I'm going to try to turn the airplane using the autopilot, but there was no reaction, whether I tried it to make it go down or up or left and right turns, no reaction. I said, now we have a problem. This is not Reyes' only problem. In the cabin, one of the injured passengers needs urgent medical attention. <sighs> Tokyo is still two and a half hours away, and Reyes decides to try and land at Naha Airport on the island of Okinawa, located 74 kilometers to the west. He orders the co-pilot to make a mayday call. Yes, sir. Naha, pile 434, heavy declaring emergency. Explosion on board. We have casualties. Requesting emergency landing at Naha. We will need full emergency services on landing. Pile 434, Naha, please repeat. Say again. Naha, pile 434, heavy declaring emergency. Explosion on board. We have casualties. Request emergency landing at Naha. We will need full emergency Getting the Japanese air traffic controller to understand the emergency proves to be difficult. Naha, Naha, Naha. This is Philippine Airlines 434, flight level 330. A bomb has exploded on board. Bravo, Oscar, Mike, Bravo. Bomb explosion. Request emergency landing at Naha. And there was silence. Then the controller came in, another controller, an American. OK, Philippine 434, I'm taking over. The American air traffic controller is from an American base on Okinawa. Turn left, heading. No, I shot back. Uh, we cannot turn at this moment yet. We will tell you when we are starting to turn yeah. towards Naha. We have problems with our flight controls. Ladies and gentlemen, this is your captain speaking. We will be making an early landing at Naha Airport in Okinawa. We'll be landing as soon as possible, so please remain in your seat with your seatbelt fastened. But landing at Naha is easier said than done. The autopilot is not responding to any of Reyes' commands, and PAL 434 is heading straight past Okinawa. Reyes must find a way to steer if he is to have any chance of landing safely. But disengaging the autopilot might result in losing what minimal control he still has over the aircraft. OK. Let's keep the seatbelt sign on. When we disengage the autopilot, we might lose control, so be ready. Since the autopilot won't react to any inputs that I make, I was scared if I disengage the autopilot, the aircraft might make a sudden bang to the right that we might not be able to control. At the count of three, I'll disengage. One, two, three. One, two, three, Tuck. nothing happened. And then there was, uh, we were relieved. I can't turn using the controls. <sighs> Looks like the explosion jammed the aileron. Dex. What does the QRH say about jammed ailerons? The QRH, or Quick Reference Handbook, is the pilot's bible that lists procedures that must be followed in emergency situations. Jammed flight controls. Use maximum force possible, including both pilots, if required. OK. Let's force it. <sighs> Reyes tries brute force to activate the ailerons, the panels on each wing which turned the aircraft. Since the explosion, he can only fly straight. I'm not getting anything from the ailerons. Can't get off this heading. OK, re-engage the autopilot while I work out our options. It's taking much longer to land than was announced. We were told it would only be 20 minutes, but it was really one hour before we landed. It was very frightening. Although they survived the bombing, passengers are now getting anxious about landing safely at Naha Airport. Since there was so much time before landing, I started writing a will. I wrote the will to my son, telling him to be strong. As PAL 434 looks like missing Naha Airport, Reyes comes up with another plan. We got to turn. 
We'll have to use differential power. Disengage auto throttle. Pull back three and four. Captain Reyes increases thrust to the engines on the left-hand side of the plane and reduces power to the engines on the right. Very slowly, the aircraft starts to circle right. He then lowers his speed to make a smaller radius turn. With guidance from air traffic control, Reyes hopes that the maneuver will eventually line up with the runway at Naha. So while we were descending on low speed, I tried to test the flight controls. And there, is, there are some little reactions. The elevator is beginning to respond. Dex. The elevator is a control that makes the plane ascend and descend. 250 knots, flaps one, on speed. In order to land safely, Reyes will need at least minimal control over the elevator and rudder. As PAL-434 nears Naha, he continues to reduce his airspeed. Flaps 10. Flaps 10 set. Speed 225. Okay, she's turning. Sir, if we reduce our weight, we will be able to reduce our approach and landing speeds. Suggest we dump fuel. That's okay. Magaling. Reyes orders the systems engineer to dump 36 tons of fuel. Five minutes, 20, pounds. Less fuel means less strain on landing gear and brakes at touchdown. Check. I was terrified when I saw the smoke trail behind each wing. I thought something must be burning and there would be another explosion. As the time to touchdown gets closer, Reyes worries that the bomb may have done more as yet unknown damage to the aircraft. I'm not certain our landing gear will hold up. Strap yourself in. I'll the purser. So he talked to the head of the cabin crew and he said, we're not sure if the gears will go down. And in case the gears collapse while landing, be ready to evacuate. It's either you, you make it or you die. That's because you cannot do anything anymore. Runway in sight. With only minimal control over the aircraft, Reyes faces the most challenging landing of his career. Ten thousand meters above the Pacific Ocean on a flight from the Philippines to Tokyo, a terrorist bomb cripples the flight controls of a jumbo jet. As PAL 434 starts its final approach, the 292 people on board are pinning their hopes of survival on the skill of Captain Ed Reyes. I know all, everybody was scared. I, we, oh, we are all scared. I know that. Gear down. The gears were supposed to come down a few seconds, but that was the longest second. <laughs> that uh, because we were waiting for the greens to come yeah. on. Take a long time. It know? took a long time. It was a long few seconds until it when it locked. Yeah. Three greens, sir. Okay. I'm disconnecting the autopilot and landing manually. Okay, Dex, monitor my descent rate. Call altitude and speed. Flaps 30. Okay, 500 feet on course. Flaps 30 set. Help me with the elevator. When I say push, I want you to push. Okay, 200 slightly left. Correcting. Push. 100. 50. 30. Power off. Pull. <clears throat> Your last uh, command was pull. Yeah. My last command was pull. <laughs> I made sure that the throttles were closed because <laughs> he might give a go around and I would make sure that we would stay on the ground. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Captain speaking. We'd like to thank you for your cooperation and your patience. The emergency crews are on their way. We'll try and get you out of here as soon as possible. Thank you. The Philippine Airlines 747 is now a crime scene under Japanese jurisdiction. As investigators from the Okinawa Police Department set out to solve the mystery of what happened, 
they turn their attention first to the dead man in seat 26K. The forensic pathologist recovered 94 fragments embedded in Ikigami's buttocks by the explosion. He suffered severe internal injuries and massive loss of blood. But tragic as it was, the effects of the explosion could have been much worse. If the explosion had been sideways, it would have blown a hole in the plane and caused an air pressure problem. In a sense, it was good that the blast was vertical. But we have to remember the victim. He died to save the rest of us. Ikegami's body bore the brunt of the upward blast, but the explosion severed the steel cables in the ceiling that control the rudder and elevator. The charge also severed the co-pilot's control cable to the right aileron, one of the control surfaces on the wing which make an aircraft bank and turn. The downward force blew a hole in the floor and could have ignited the vapors in the center fuel tank, creating a catastrophic explosion. But by chance, on December the 11th, seat 26K was not located above the tank. Fortunately for us, we took a different version, the SAS version of the 747 that day. And that specific seat for that version was two seats forward of the center tank. The Okinawa forensic investigators immediately start work collecting evidence from the bomb site. They begin with the largest fragments of debris and then systematically work down until the smallest particles are retrieved by vacuum cleaner. Japanese investigators cannot identify the bomb's detonator. But by separating out bits of metal, plastic and electrical wire that do not belong to the plane, components of the bomb are pieced together. one forensic investigator is able to identify the bomb's timer. By reconstituting dozens of burnt fragments, he discovers it's a modified digital wristwatch. Investigators also discover that one of the bomb's 9-volt batteries is only sold in the Philippines. It's another clue that suggests that the bomber could be based there. Philippine National Police Deputy Chief Sonny Raisin is on the case. In the later part of 1994, we already started to receive information, intelligence reports, that there were uh, Middle Eastern personalities that uh, were here already in the Philippines. On the night of January the 6th, 1995, almost four weeks after the bombing of PAL 434, the Philippine police get a lucky break. In his Manila apartment, the PAL 434 bomber has enlisted the help of an accomplice to mass produce his new undetectable bomb. <laughs> An attempt to burn off chemicals gets out of hand. Acrid smelling smoke spills out of the apartment. It attracts the attention of the doorman who comes to investigate. What's going on? Sorry, sorry. Uh, we, we're playing with some fireworks, but it's okay. We put them out and we have all the windows open inside and we keep the door closed. It will be fine, okay? Uh, you all open the door. No, no, no. If we open the door, the smoke comes in the hallway. You keep it closed to go out the window, okay? It's okay. It's okay. Until the smoke dissipates, the bombers decide to wait outside the apartment. The doorman isn't convinced by their playing with fireworks story, and he calls the fire department and the police. By the time the firemen come, the smoke is gone, and they leave after a quick check. The bomber now realizes he's left a very sensitive item in the apartment and he persuades his friend to retrieve his laptop. He was uh, too clever a guy to come back and uh, expose himself. 
because all along he knew that uh, that would be too risky for him to go back and be caught. The bomber's fear of getting caught is justified. Once police inspector Ada Farascal learns that they're from Pakistan, she insists on seeing their room for herself. The police in Manila are on high alert due to a planned visit by the Pope in a few days. What Inspector Farascal finds confirms her worst fears about the intentions of the tenants. The shot distracts the apprentice and he trips over a fallen palm tree. But the cop discovers he has no handcuffs. The doorman improvises with the drawstrings of his windbreaker. In the meantime, the bomber vanishes. One of the first senior officers to arrive at his apartment is Sonny Raisin. Incident at uh, Doña Josepa apartment uh, was the breakthrough in uh, opening our eyes that uh, the Al-Qaeda terrorist cell was already operating here in the Philippines. The Philippine National Police know they've stumbled onto something big, and they inform Interpol, Scotland Yard, and the FBI. When news of the raid reaches the Joint Terrorism Task Force in New York, it immediately grabs the attention of FBI Special Agent Frank Pellegrino. For two years, he has been hunting a terrorist called Ramzi Youssef, and it looks as if this might be his man. Well, he was always our focus since 93. I mean, at the time, that was the, you know, he was the biggest fugitive around. As Philippine police comb through the apartment, they begin to find more evidence tying Youssef to the bombing of PAL-434. There was a similarity between the watches that were found in the apartment and the type of uh, watch that was used in, in Okinawa. You're putting together that, that watch that was the watch that was on the bomb. Uh, on that flight 434 and identifying those pieces eventually as a Casio watch. You know, it was amazing. Youssef is a skilled forger. Investigators find several identification cards bearing various names and photos in each of which he looks quite different. One ID card is of particular interest. So, almost there's a dig to us. This, the ID card used the first World Trade Center bombing date as the date that the card was issued. So we knew right away it was, was Yosef that, was, that had been in the apartment. They knew chemicals. The chemical dictionary uh, was uh, a very well-used uh, item, uh, underlined, highlighted, uh, well-read uh, notations throughout the book, uh, something that he used quite often. And uh, you know, I don't remember the exact number. I think there might have been 100 latent prints found on that that belonged to him. They knew electronics. The way that the, the timing device was hidden inside the Casio watch um, just made the whole, the whole thing very uh, concealable and, uh, and very worrisome. The identification of the bomber of PAL-434 and the discovery of his bomb factory is very disturbing news for those responsible for airline passenger safety. Ramzi Youssef is an international terrorist who knows how to get his bombs past airport security. Bombs that are small, but if strategically located, can blow up a jumbo jet and kill not just one, but hundreds of people. And the bomber of PAL 434 is still on the loose. The Philippine National Police have stumbled on the hideout of an international terrorist. The FBI identify him as Ramzi Youssef. Evidence that Amaldo Forlani, the man who planted the bomb on PAL-434, is the same person as Ramzi Youssef, 
comes from the travel agent who sold him the Philippine Airlines ticket. Ramzi Youssef is just one of several aliases of a man who tops the FBI's most wanted list. An international terrorist with a two million dollar bounty on his head. Youssef, whose real name is probably Abdul Karim Basit, was born and raised in Kuwait where his father worked as an engineer. It was there that he met the friend that he enlisted to help him in the Manila bomb factory. When he was 18, Youssef's family returned to their Pakistan homeland. Youssef married and had two children. Soon after returning home, his parents sent him to study in Britain. He was taking classes both in engineering and in uh, using the computer. So he definitely had some talent. In summer breaks from college in the late 1980s, Youssef returns to Pakistan. He puts his new engineering skills to use by teaching bomb making to militants in training camps near Peshawar, Pakistan. These camps are fertile ground for making contacts with militants worldwide. In September 1992, Youssef flies from Pakistan to New York to prepare for a major terrorist attack. On arrival at JFK, he presents a fake Iraqi passport and asks for political asylum from Saddam Hussein. The ploy works and he's allowed to enter the country. Six months later, on February the 26th, 1993, one of the largest homemade bombs in American history explodes in the garage below the World Trade Center, killing six people, injuring hundreds, and causing $500 million worth of damage. That night, Youssef is on a plane back to his home in Pakistan. He was an action figure. He wanted to keep doing things. Uh, he wasn't happy with the one success he had. 18 months after the World Trade Center attack, Youssef flies to Manila to fine-tune the bomb that he plants on PAL-434. According to Sonny Raisin, the Philippine capital suits him. Ramsey Youssef uh, loved to enjoy life. He, was a, he is a ladies' man. Uh, he associated himself with a lot of uh, girlfriends, and uh, he liked to party. He, he also drank a lot. See, and he enjoyed the life, terrorists. They are your normal day-to-day uh, -day people, the uh, guy next door. After the bombing of PAL-434, Youssef arranges for his childhood friend Abdul Hakim Murad to assist him in Manila. But on January the 6th, 1995, two weeks after his arrival, Murad is arrested and sent to the Philippine police headquarters for interrogation. It took 67 days to extract the details of how Youssef planted the bomb. My uh, impressions of him was that uh, he was uh, strong-willed. He was uh, determined. Uh, initially, he did not break down in uh, questioning. And uh, it was only when uh, the FBI team that came in and provided us with uh, additional information or pieces of the puzzle that uh, we did not have, that he started to talk. Tiny chemical traces of the explosive were found on PAL-434, and Murad eventually admits that Youssef uses liquid nitroglycerin that he's stabilized and concealed in a bottle of contact lens solution. Murad also reveals that Youssef hid the bomb's potentially suspicious components in the heel of his shoes. Most airport security systems only detect metal above the ankles. I bet you he was cool as could be. He was somewhat uh, cavalier in his attitude towards these explosives and chemicals. To carry a container of nitroglycerin on, a, on an airplane, uh, you yeah. know, gotta be a little nuts. Murad's confession provides details of Youssef's actions after he successfully got the bomb components past airport security. Can I get you some juice or coffee? Juice, please. Okay. 
Yusef designed the device so the innocent looking components can be quickly transformed into a lethal bomb. Yusef has modified a digital wristwatch as the bomb's timer. This is wired to a detonator inside the bottle of nitroglycerin. Two 9 volt batteries provide an additional electric charge to the exposed filament of a light bulb that will spark the explosion. Yusef sets the alarm for four hours later when he anticipates the plane will be flying high over the Pacific Ocean. Yusef plants the bomb in a life vest pouch under his seat, a place ground crews are unlikely to inspect during the stopover in Cebu. Soon after, he gets off the plane and disappears. Four hours later, the time bomb under seat 26K awakes the airline industry to a new kind of terrorism. Murat's confession confirms Pellegrino's suspicions. This is just the kind of sophisticated plot he has come to expect from Ramzi Youssef. But Pellegrino is still shocked by what Murad says next. PAL 434 was only a test, a dry run for a much larger terrorist plot that will kill thousands of airline passengers. A highly skilled terrorist, Ramzi Youssef, has already set off a new type of bomb on an aircraft. Now the FBI discovers Youssef wants to blow up more planes. And he continues to evade capture. FBI investigators find evidence of Youssef's meticulous planning on secret files on the laptop that he so desperately wanted his accomplice to retrieve. On the laptop computer found in the Youssef apartment building, was a file which laid out a plan for five individuals using code names, individuals not mentioned on the plan, to uh, board about three planes each, I mean, two planes, a couple of people had three planes, planting bombs on the planes, uh, and then uh, returning back to their home. Hoping when they planted the bombs and with the timing devices, if everything went well, uh, all bombs would go off Within about a six hour time period, uh, any more than one would have been, been an airline disaster. Um, so, you know, if they were 50% successful in their plan, I think it would have scared a lot of people for a long time. The file on Youssef's laptop reveals that the plan, codenamed Bojinka, is foiled with no time to spare. The bombing of 12 American planes is meant to kill 4,000 passengers. Youssef's campaign of terror against the airlines is scheduled to start less than two weeks after the bust of his bomb factory in Manila. By the time Pellegrino and the FBI team arrive in the Philippines, Youssef is long gone. So it was a worry and it was a, a missed opportunity. Um, but we, we also, on a lot of these fugitive type cases, uh, you know, we're all not that different and everybody goes home. Everybody needs to go home. And uh, so the investigation again would focus back uh, to Pakistan. The FBI immediately begin a publicity campaign in Pakistan, promoting their $2 million reward for assistance in arresting Youssef. The strategy works. Youssef's latest recruit for yet another airline bombing blows the whistle. On the day Youssef is due to leave his hotel in Islamabad, a Pakistani SWAT team moves in. Sim 
من اليهود شو بدك شو بدك In Yusuf's room are Delta and United Airlines flight schedules as well as bomb components hidden in children's toys Who are you? Do you have a warrant? The informer receives the 2 million dollar bounty for the tip off which prevents yet another airline attack He was shocked did not think he would be he would be caught he had a certain confidence about him and i didn't think he thought we'd ever catch up to him within hours of his capture yusef is extradited from pakistan and put on a waiting us government plane with the cooperation of the japanese and philippine governments the fbi arranged for yusef to stand trial in new york city for the pal 434 bombing as well as the earlier 1993 attack on the world trade center in a convoy of federal and local patrol cars, Ramzi Ahmed Youssef was brought into New York City late Wednesday night, ending a worldwide manhunt. He was arrested Tuesday in Pakistan by Pakistani authorities and brought back by the FBI on a U.S. plane, then into custody with heavy security on the street in case of any terrorist attacks prompted by his arrest. At his trial a year later in New York's Southern District Court, Youssef decides to handle his own defense against the advice of the judge. He performs better than expected, but he is found guilty on all charges related to the bombing of PAL 434 and conspiring to bomb 12 American passenger planes. Youssef is also found guilty in a second trial for the World Trade Center bombing. In his final summing up, Youssef justifies his actions. Yes, I am a terrorist and proud of it. And I only support terrorism so long as it's against the United States government and against Israel, because you are more than terrorists. Although Pakistani, Youssef describes himself as Palestinian by choice. And he justifies the PAL 434 and World Trade Center bombings as punishment for a U.S. foreign policy that favors Israel over Palestine. And hypocrites! For both crimes, he's sentenced to 240 years in prison. The judge recommends solitary confinement for life in the most secure prison in the United States, located in Florence, Colorado. It houses the country's most violent and dangerous prisoners, and it's where Youssef will spend the rest of his life, confined in a cell for up to 23 out of every 24 hours. We cannot uh, afford to uh, just sit down and uh, uh, count our victories with the arrest of uh, Ramsey Youssef. Somebody else has already replaced him and somebody else is already thinking of how to circumvent these uh, security measures that we put up. In the year following Youssef's attack on PAL 434, the Federal Aviation Administration certified a machine to detect explosives. Not one American carrier bought it. Only after 9-11 was a law passed that required U.S. airports to deploy explosive detection systems. But the most reliable models are expensive or too slow and still not widely employed. Well, they were still saying, you know, we have to be right 100% of the time. Terrorists only have to be right once. Although there hasn't been a successful airliner bombing since PAL 434, those who forget the past may be destined to revisit it. <laughs>